Mr. Knight, whenever you are ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Jim Knight with the Department of Developmental Services. Just wanted to touch briefly on what you have in the agenda on a couple of uh, issues that we one has been covered somewhat earlier before on the new home and community-based services regulations uh, implement or promulgated by the federal government and effective in March of 20, 2014. Uh, these regulations establish requirements for settings where people uh, receive services and uh, require that those settings are integrated in and, and support the full access, people's full access in the community. Um, prior federal policies really focused more on how big a setting or especially a home was rather than looking now with these new requirements on the outcomes uh, for folks in those settings. While the Lanterman Act certainly supports these uh, new requirements, changes in the state requirements uh, will need to be made to comply with these new federal requirements. Part of what we need to do uh, from the federal perspective is that we need to develop what's called a transition plan that spells out for the federal government, um, one, an assessment of where we are as a state in relation to the federal requirements, and two, what steps we're going to take in order to come into compliance by March of 2019. To this end, there's a few things that we have done so far. One is that the department has established a, an advisory group consisting of a broad array of stakeholders. Um, the group has actually uh, been in, has informed much of what's in the transition plan now, including doing an assessment of where we are um, as far as our state regulations and policies and developing information that we'll use to assess individual settings as well. Additionally, the group is uh, uh, provided some suggestions that are now proposals in the governor's budget, including the funding for uh, providers to come into compliance, the $15 million if they need to make changes to their services. Um, in addition, the proposed trailer bill language that allow us flexibility uh, to make changes more quickly as, as we identify those needs. Um, the continued involvement of this group and a wide variety of others is going to be important as we move forward. And we're looking um, to schedule the next meeting of the group in mid-April. There are a number of things that are left to be done. Um, we're working with our sister departments, health care services, aging, and others who also uh, have responsibility over services that are uh, funded under these new regulations uh, to develop and get approval from the federal government for this transition plan. Uh, in particular, one of the things that has been, been asked of us is that we need to provide more detail about what steps we're going to take in order to come into compliance. Uh, while to date no state has had a transition plan approved by the federal government, um, they have uh, indicated they're actively working with states in order to make that happen in the coming months. One thing that's going to help us, uh, especially in identifying some of the steps that we're going to take are the proposals that we talked about earlier. Um, in order to, one, to provide funding for, for providers, also the extra resources that are in our budget as well to do more of the activities, the outreach, the assessment, and the like that's going to be necessary to show the federal government where we're at. And additionally, in conjunction with stakeholders, we do need to establish and revise state requirements and not only comply with the federal government's uh, regulations, but also shape how services will be delivered. So we're really going to look to the stakeholders to assist us in helping define and shape um, what the services will look like after this transition. Next, I want to touch on self-determination. Uh, as noted in the uh, agenda, Senate Bill 468 was signed into a law authorizing this new option um, for uh, consumers and their families. The law contains eligibility, operational, and other requirements, including the contingency for federal funding in order to implement the program. With the assistance of a stakeholder advisory group, we've accomplished a great deal so far, including defining and determining what types of services we'd like to provide through the program, establishing a, an equitable process for selecting the initial uh, 2,500 people who will be uh, able to enroll in the program, and also developing a video and other informational materials that will help people learn more about what self-determination is. However, there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, in response to our waiver application, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has asked for clarification on a variety of items. This is uh, very typical of when we submit an application for federal funding. Um, 
without going into a lot of detail, do you want to highlight one area that they've requested uh, further clarification on? It's one we just discussed is uh, how this uh, waiver and how self-determination will uh, meet the new requirements of the home and community settings rules. Unlike the transition period that's allowed for currently approved waivers, any new waiver, which self-determination would be, would have to be in compliance before it's approved. So we're working with the advisory group to develop some strategies to address this and other areas that the federal government has asked. And we're hoping to submit the responses to all the questions that CMS has by the end of this month. So in addition to working through on federal approval, we're also working on a number of other things that are necessary for us before we can implement the program. And that includes finalizing training and other informational materials. And this has been a very long process thus far. And obtaining federal approval, unfortunately, usually is. When we add in the complexities of the new settings rules that we talked about, in addition to uh, explaining to the federal government the new structure that for California we're looking in and in, in anticipating with self-determination, this has added to the time that it's going to take for federal approval. That being said, we're very committed to making sure that this works and so that we can have this as an option for the folks um, who receive services now. And thank you. We'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, sir. Um, we'll continue uh, in the presentation, uh, Mr. Omoto. Money. I just want to put my timer on here so I don't go over. Yeah, never mind. Just not working. Marty Omoto, California Disability Senior Community Action Network, City Can, and also the California Person Centered Advocacy Partnership. I'm also a family member. Um, I'm a member of the Developmental Services Task Force and also the uh, Home and Community-Based Services Work Group that Jim Knight referred to and the Self-Determination Work Group. I want to, first of all, again, echo the comments made by a lot of the other advocates about the work that you have done, Mr. Thurman, and also the other members of the legislature and the administration in working with all of us as advocates and also the subcommittee staff and the budget staff because it was not an easy time for all of us to come together on a solution. And this is an ongoing effort, so really appreciate your commitment. I just wanted to emphasize that policymaking and advocacy needs to be centered on the person receiving or needing services and supports and also then on the person who provides or needs to provide it. For instance, the closure of home, uh, group homes or any type of facility uh, is important knowing that fact, but it's also as important in knowing what happened to those people who were there in those programs and what happened to the workers who worked in those programs. Toward that end, a couple of areas that we want to uh, highlight or make recommendations on, on the home and community-based services waiver regulations. Number one, we really urge the legislature and the state to move forward and to identify an aggressive timeline, a public timeline, uh, that really identifies the milestones, and I think you've been pushing on timelines for a lot of these uh, issues, and it's really important because the public and everyone else needs to know where is the state going, but also what are the milestones. Uh, the other thing is the state needs to identify part of that, how far will it go in terms of compliance towards uh, home and community-based services rigs. State can go further, but right now no one knows what the state is going to do, and so that's causing confusion and panic in some cases in the community that is unnecessary. And the other thing is the state can do and the legislature can do amazing things with these new regulations. And so the sooner we can do this and identify a timeline, the better and it's good for the legislature to identify milestones and outcomes. Number two, outreach to the community. That is sorely needed. There is a lack of any information that's credible not only to the people with developmental disabilities like my own sister when she was alive, but the families and the providers and the workers and regional centers about what change is going to come down to them. Also, it's not only what change is coming, but how can they participate in shaping that change? And that's really important. As uh, one of the advocates said in, in the line there, we need to treat this transition in the same way that we treat the closure of a developmental center, with the same respect, with the same comprehension in terms of involving stakeholders, in the D.C. closures, they have had stakeholder meetings throughout the state involving people and their thoughts about how they want the transition to occur. It needs to be person-centered. Number three, there needs to be a requirement in the individual program plans that you used to do 
that emphasizes outcomes and reporting that are person-centered plan as a requirement and to identify a standard of what person-centered planning is. And that's required in, under the Home and Community-Based Services Rule. Number four, funding in the, in the governor's transition proposal needs to include training and outreach on what a person-centered plan is and also the other elements of the regulations. Number five, the trailer bill, uh, the trailer bill uh, uh, related to this issue needs to repeal the ban on the startups of new programs because the whole concept of trying to restructure programs, there is an existing ban on the startups. Number six, uh, the trailer bill needs to identify the role of the regional center evaluators and also uh, some guidance on what proposals from the community, meaning the providers, would qualify for funding. Seven, transition funding should also include outcomes that address reducing unmet needs of people not receiving services and supports, uh, reducing cultural disparities and looking at different ways to provide and fund services that include wage differentials tied to a person's more complex needs, wage differentials tied to reaching hard to serve people due to geography, language, or unmet <coughs> needs. Eight, the state needs to require and provide the necessary resources for real-time case management reporting, digital software, such as the type of case management software being used in Orange County. It's called Virtual Chart. I think one or two other regional centers are using it. And also require and provide resources for, for providers to have a similar type of monitoring software. The reason is, is because the state and legislature needs information about outcomes uh, and also to identify information about the people being served. On the issue of self-determination, my uh, fellow advocate here will talk more about that, but I just want to emphasize that there needs to be tra trailer bill language that sets forth oversight and an aggressive timeline on regarding the approval of the waiver. That we think that has gone on too long. Uh, and secondly, that the self-determination waiver can be actually an example for the state in identifying how the state can, can become compliant on different types of models of home and community-based type services. Uh, on the issue of overtime for supported living services, we urge that there's trailer bill to identify for the purposes of implementing the Department of Labor regulations that supported living service workers would be operating under a 40-hour work week to invoke overtime also provisions that would uh, clarify that supported living service agencies are not joint employers with IHSS, and also con to consider person-centered supports for people who need supported living and to consider those exceptions on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. And also consider um, the idea that we proposed earlier that a person eligible for regional center services can receive all of their needed home care through supported uh, living services and also to look at the possibility of providing wage differentials that address people's different types of needs. Lastly, um, I want to just emphasize the issue of cultural disparities. That should be a component of everything we do, not an afterthought or something that we do later. And I think one of the things that we would urge is trailer bill language to, uh, to really identify how the additional funding toward that end to the regional centers, which we think was a great idea, how that will be addressed and to involve stakeholders. And one more point about competitive integrated employment. We think that's a great idea pushed forward by the administration and also by stakeholders, but we want to emphasize that trailer bill language be put together that, in, that ensures the involvement of all stakeholders, including families and people with disabilities. Thank you. Please continue. Hi, my name is Judy Mark. I'm a volunteer uh, advocate with the Autism Society of Los Angeles, and I'm also a mom of a 19-year-old son with autism. Uh, thank you, Assemblymember Thurmond and the committee for inviting me uh, to present testimony today. In 2013, the California legislature embarked on creating a revolution in our developmental disability system, the biggest change since it was created a half century ago. The Senate and Assembly unanimously passed SB 468, creating a self-determination program that offers consumers choice and control over the services through person-centered planning. Based on an extremely successful pilot project, it became the first law of its kind in the nation and a huge leap forward in the civil rights of, dis of individuals with developmental disabilities. And it is because of you, the legislature, that this life 
changing opportunity exists. And we want to thank you for all that you've done and for highlighting this critical issue today. So it's been two and a half years since the law was passed, and thousands of consumers and families keep asking us why the law has not taken effect yet. It's because the law requires the state to apply for federal matching funds, as you've heard, uh, for the self-determination program. The Department of Developmental Services, who's worked very closely with stakeholders, and we really appreciate that, although we wish that there would be a bit more urgency in the work that they've done. Um, submitted a new application last September and in December received 180 questions from the federal government about their application. The most significant concerns lie in how DDS and regional centers will ensure that the services comply with the new federal settings rules. As you heard, the self-determination program, because it requires a new waiver, must comply with the new rules immediately. ASLA recently held a major conference on these issues where a federal official stated that our self-determination law, Cal the only state with a law like this, is a model for the nation. But she expressed dismay at the lack of responsiveness from California on our efforts to comply with the new settings rules. Since the federal government is troubled by how California is responding to the bigger changes for all consumers in three years, how can they trust that the self-determination program will follow the rules even sooner? We are pleased to learn that DDS has promised to send their answers to the federal government's questions about self-determination by the end of this month. And we must all work together to ensure that we are responding quickly and adequately to the federal government. Federal officials have expressed confidence that they will approve our self-determination waiver if we can provide assurances on the service settings. But because self-determination waiver intersects with the more significant concerns about the settings rules, our waiver may get held up. Thus, we ask the committee to get involved in the following ways. We ask that our state agencies keep the community regularly informed about the status of the self-determination waiver as well as the state transition plan. We ask the state agencies work closely with the federal government and take advantage of their offered technical assistance. And we need the state of California to show progress towards modifying our system to comply with the new federal settings rules, which the self-determination program must follow immediately. We stand prepared to work alongside the departments on these efforts because thousands of consumers desperately want choice and control and are waiting for this self-determination revolution. Many individuals, for many individuals, the traditional system is not working and their outcomes are poor. Despite the billions of dollars put into the system, 80% of individuals are still unemployed. Too many consumers aren't involved in the decisions affecting their lives and are shepherded into programs that don't meet their needs. Self-determination is for people like Diana, who has cerebral palsy and types with her nose on a device to communicate, but is also a graphic designer. Diana wants to use self-determination to move into her own place, start a business, and get reliable transportation, which she believes she can do with the same funds that she currently spends. And self-determination is for my son, Joshua, who is 19 years old and has autism. He would like to live in a house with roommates, but he will need help 24-7. He wants to hire his own staff and choose what he does each day to make his life fulfilled, not what someone else has written into a plan that he had nothing to do with. Self-determination is a basic human right to be able to choose what you do each day, who you spend your day with, and what you do with your time. Everyone should have that right, regardless of their ability. This is a revolution by self-advocates and families that will bring a needed evolution to our system. And this is why delay is unacceptable. This is why we have mounted a statewide self-determination now campaign, pushing to make California's self-determination law a reality now. We have brought self-determination now buttons for you to wear, and you should wear them proudly because the legislature is responsible for giving us our extraordinary law. But a law means nothing until it is implemented with integrity. So we ask you for your help to make sure that the self-determination program becomes a reality soon for the thousands of individuals with developmental disabilities whose lives will improve because of it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Mark, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Amoto. Um, and now we will have testimony from Ms. Abu Hassan from Disability Rights California. Welcome. Thank you, Chair and members. Evelyn Abu Hassan with Disability Rights California. 
Um, we, I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. I'd like to echo many of the comments, thanking the legislature and the administration for resolving the MCO tax, which is going to bring in $418 million into the developmental disability system. I've provided written comments to the sergeants for your use, so I'm going to keep my um, testimony and my comments brief. Our system is a system in transition, and as people move out of the developmental centers, we need to make sure that the community is strong enough to receive them. We need to increase community capacity and increase crisis capacity. Otherwise, individuals are going to end up in places like Institutes for Mental Disease, which are locked community facilities. It's come to our attention that many consumers are remaining in IMDs for longer than the 180-day statutory limit. We think it's critical to strengthen the IMD statute to define what constitutes an emergency for placement. We also think it's critical to consider a separate community plan placement fund um, to deflect consumers from placement in IMDs as these placements do not provide quality services or, or receive um, federal funds. As many have already said, we need to ensure compliance with the home and community-based waiver regulations. Otherwise, the state will um, lose federal funding by March 2019. We support the government's targeted, governor's targeted proposals and investment in transition funding, but note that DDS has yet to provide clear guidance to achieve compliance and ensure effective implementation. We note that all the waiver services, including the self-determination waiver that Judy just talked about, are tied to HCBS compliance, and we urge the department and stakeholders to continue to work together and provide assurances that the requirements will be met so we can obtain that services, which we know that consumers and families want. We also need to focus on increasing, uh, reducing the service complexities that have come into our system with the changes in service standards and the reductions that were taken in 2009. The system is much more complex. Families have to access generic services such as Medi-Cal and be denied and then appeal or have the region, regional center determine that the appeal does not have merit before the regional centers will pay for services. What we know is that low-income families do not have the time, the resources, or the skills to appeal decisions. Thus, they forego services. These are Medicaid-funded services regardless of which agency provides um, the service, so the state is not really saving any money. A final word about the increase in the community placement plan funds. We support the increases in the governor's budget of the CPP funds, but believe there needs to be greater transparent, transparency monitor, and monitoring and oversight of these funds to ensure appropriate um, success of DC closures and transition of consumers into the community. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Um, uh, there there comments from the LEO's office? Thank you, Mr. Chair. We would just add to our commentary earlier from um, the issue number three, um, just to give the committee a little bit more context in terms of timelines as it relates to compliance uh, with regard to the HCBS rules. Again, the state would need to become compliant by March of 2019 um, for services to continue to receive uh, federal funding. However, we would note that the, the state's HCBS waiver is up for renewal um, in March of 2017 and would need to have an acceptable transition plan Plan and process by which to come into compliance and maintain compliance um, in order to receive renewal for that waiver, which represents about $1.7 billion in federal funding. Um, with regard to um, issues raised um, on this uh, uh, critical juncture, we, we see that the parameters for which the service provider eligibility funding and process needs additional detail, um, uh, leadership is critical, um, and again, um, coordination with the Department of Healthcare Services as the lead um, Medicaid state agency is also very important. Thank you. Thank you. Anything from finance? Thank you. Carla Gustaniela, Department of Finance, uh, uh, agree with the comments on the coordination. Um, a, as stated, the waiver renewal and the workload associated with the new regulations, the, the, there are several proposals that you've already heard um, to try to address that fluid nature of the changing or the, or the more clarification of guidelines from the federal government for home and community-based services. Um, so these will be con these will continue to be evaluated. Um, we also just wanted to note a few of the trailer bill suggestions would also require more coordination. For example, the overtime um, affects several departments. Thank you. Is there any public comment? Will we ask our speakers to just take a, about a minute, and uh, we welcome your public comment. 
Hello, Mr. Thurman. Just want to reiterate that I um, want to remind you that um, it's Rick Hodgkins, by the way. I want to remind you that um, group home clients must be able to choose if they want a room to themselves and food any time of the day. With regards to self-determination, I disagree with the part of the law that says that you have to use generic resources because as you know, Mr. Thurman, being a social worker, generic, using generic resources may mean uh, being in the most restricted area, whereas self-determination, what are getting services through way of self-determination or the traditional system, the providers provide services in the least restricted. And many of you Everyone that's worked in and outside of this building knows uh, about Sacramento County's Therapeutic Recreation Services, which is a, a division of the Sacramento County Department of Parks and Recreation. They mandate that uh, all clients that participate in their programs going on trips be in the most restricted area, not in the least restricted environment. And I, as you being a social worker, I hope you understand that you know, for self-determination, we need to be in the least restricted environment, not the most like Therapeutic Recreation Services does. And finally, do you remember Tony Thurman from Golden Gate Regionals? I mean, not Tony Thurman, but uh, Herman Cothy. Herman Cothy from Golden Gate Regional Center. He says hello. Please pass along my greetings. Thank you. Hi, Nancy Chance, um, Choices Person-Centered Services. I'm the executive director there. I'm also a family member, and I'm a member of the California Person-Centered Advocacy Partnership. Um, I want to echo what everyone else has said, and thank you all for the, your work towards um, providing desperately needed funding for the Department of the, uh, for Developmental Services. So thank you. I didn't say that last time I was here, and I, I should have. Um, I want to echo the comments made by both Marty, Mr. Omoto and um, Judy Mark. I think uh, the proposals made by Marty Omoto are just so important and I think need to be considered. I'd like to speak just briefly on a couple of those things. Um, <clears throat> I believe that we have some amazing opportunities ahead of us with the home and new rules to the home and community-based services waivers, waiver, um, but we need to know exactly what the rules are. I'm a provider. I want to I want to be compliant. I want to do a great job. I want to be able to use these things to provide services that I haven't been able to maybe do before. But we have to know what we need to do to be compliant, and we don't know that. So um, that to me is like probably the most important part of this is getting those very clear rules out to tell us what we need to do so we can do them. Um, secondly, um, I support legislation to clarify the 40-hour work week um, versus an eight-hour work day for supported living. I also support legislation for the, to make it clear that supported living agencies and um, um, in-home supported services are not joint employers. And I support moving quickly towards self-determination. Self-determination could make just all the difference for people. So um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you to the panel. You guys made our made great points, and now we didn't have to do them all. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Allison Howard. Um, I'm the Director of Program Services um, for Choices Person-Centered Services, and I'm also a part of the California Person-Centered Advocacy Partnership. Um, I just wanted to thank you for letting us have an opportunity to express ourselves today. Um, and I would like to simply say that as part of both of the ag both the agency and working with the partnership, we spend a lot of a lot of time and really fair um, discussion on how we can be both compliant and fiscally responsible. And I'd like to support the ideas that Marty Amoto presented as pliable ways for us to do so. Simply put, that's what I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Marcy Hodge, and I am the Executive Director for St. John's Boys Home in Oakland. I just wanted to speak quickly to the um, compliance issues. Uh, because we deal with regional center, specifically the East Bay, um, as a new provider, we've been open since 2008, but we recently, in the last few years, switched over to regional center serving, from serving juvenile hall kids. Um, as a new provider, uh, with regional center, uh, these compliance issues, they really need to be, and regulations, um, re really need to fall in line more or less with the CDSS. When we dealt with California Department of Social Services, we knew uh, what the regulations were. We dealt with um, the regulations as far as compliance issues, and we were able to get those things um, to meet 
whatever issues came up. With regional centers, it's a different matter. Uh, many times you're dealing with a personality where um, you're not necessarily always dealing with regulations. Uh, we were on sanctions for seven months. We had three clients. Uh, you're not going to have very many group homes open having them on sanctions for seven months where they can't receive new, new clients or even expand their programs. Uh, that can be absolutely detrimental to a program. After I sent an appeal in, they finally lifted the regulations once they saw that within the first two months we met all of our requirements. So these are things that we need to really look at. Also, the, uh, as it speaks here about the POS, the disparities, there are also real disparities as it relates to interaction with uh, um, et particular vendors of certain ethnicities. And so we really need to consider that because if we're going to work hand in hand with the vulnerable population who we enjoy serving because that's why we're here, we, we, want, we, want, to, um, we want regional center to engage with us uh, with the respect that we serve our clients with. So these are issues that I have, and I certainly will be here more often so that we have more of a voice. Um, as you look at your uh, audience, you don't see many folks like me. It's because many vendors, African-American vendors, Latinos, they're fighting with regional center trying to keep their programs open. So we need a voice, and I, I'm hoping that maybe you would consider town hall meetings so that vendors who can't get out here to Sacramento, uh, maybe you can hear their voices in their local communities about what's going on. Thank you. Thank you, and um, just want to acknowledge uh, a longtime education uh, champion and trustee Hodge who served um, on the college board uh, in the district and in the city that I happen to represent. And when the committee welcomes you and uh, appreciates uh, the concerns that you've raised today, thank you for being here and for your testimony. Hi, my name is Jackie Dillard Foss. And first, I want to talk as the executive director of the STEP program and providing supported living services to 175 individuals um, and the arranged marriage we're in with in home support services. That's what I like to call it because I didn't actually choose to marry him, but I was told I had to. Um, with in home support services, we have the overtime ruling. The overtime applies, and we have the joint employment. No one wants to give us clarity. We've talked to the federal government. You talk to the state. So there's really no clarity, except when you go in front of Department of Labor and they give you the clarity you want. So um, there is a hope that we can have an amicable se separation and, you know, divorce-friendly and no longer have to deal with them. That would be a dream come true in the supportive living. I don't know how it got generic because it doesn't feel very generic because it takes up a lot, a lot of time. On the other side of that is wage order 15. Hopefully the wage order is being updated. And because supported living services and IHSS are tied like this, the 40-hour work week that's federal is what they are going by in IHSS. So most SLS providers are assuming the same. So hopefully we can get clarity. I do hope with Mr. Omoto's um, information about joint employment, we've got to do something because providers are terrified of that relationship and the cause it could have. On the second side of this, I'd want to um, address Evelyn on the crisis in the community. The crisis homes, if we could figure out enhanced supported living services where a person doesn't have to be removed from their home, that a crisis team can come in, help the person stay where they're at, that we could actually pay our, our staff that work with those individuals with more complex needs a wage that is higher than someone with not as complex needs. But because of that IHSS dysfunctional relationship, it makes it very challenging. So I do think, I know that Dr. Kalisha Kripke has a um, proposal on enhanced supported living services. We really need to take a hard look at that because people going in and out of the hospitals on 5150s and being sat in a, an emergency room and that's where they get their therapy, it's not good enough, or being stuck in an IMD and getting trapped in that circle. We have to do better. We can do better. We have the resources to do better. We just have to have the will. So I think that's it. Oh, and the other one thing, on behalf of Carol McKinney with the Supportive Living Network, the median rates are really, really drying up the system. If we can lift the median rates, you're going to get new providers to provide new services. So so please take a hard look at median rates and what we can do with redirecting that money on the purchase of service, because I do think you're going to see wonderful things happen when people can go above the median rate and provide those services. Thank you. Uh, Doug Pascover with Imagine Supported Living Services in Aptos, California, and the California Person-Centered Advocacy Partnership. Um, first of all, I just want to say 
Thank you to our friends at the department and in the legislature. We are doing our work with more hopeful creativity and a little bit less grim determination this year. And it's, it's, it's really, uh, it really changed the spirit. I want to um, agree with some of the things that some of the panelists said, especially around the need to get more clarity sooner on the HCBS waiver, uh, the need to start self-determination yesterday, if at all possible, and get that resubmitted, and the need to be more diligent in looking into unmet needs and disparate, disparate services uh, so that we can work towards a system where everybody gets the services they need regardless of which community they live in or were born into. Thank you. Thank you. Barry Giardini again on behalf of CDSA. I'd just like to speak for a second on the state transition plan for the HCBS waiver. Um, as we all know, the, the timeline is ever approaching, but we, we lack a blueprint to get there. So we have plenty of providers who, are, who would look to get compliant, but they don't know yet how to do so. So at this point, if, if there's anything that can be done to expedite the process, and Mr. Chair, if, or you, you or one of your colleagues would consider uh, a legislative oversight committee, Anything that we could do to keep the conversation going so that we don't just leave it into the, in the budget process to keep the conversation going, we would, we would recommend that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any additional public comment? I see none. I want to thank all of uh, all those who provided their presentations and testimony today. Uh, thank you to the, all of the department staff, um, finance staff, LAO staff. Um, our budget staff, thank you, and uh, thank you to all of you, our advocates and partners, for the great work you do on behalf of Californians with developmental disabilities. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.